All right, we're going to get uh, rolling again with uh, Nick Fink. Uh, Nick is uh, no stranger to the IAUX community in Seattle. He's worked in web usability for over a decade, and he specializes in, in information architecture, interaction design, uh, usability, and user research for web and mobile. Uh, Nick has created web and mobile experiences for Fortune 500 companies, including Adobe, Intel, REI, Represent, Boeing, Google, and Oprah.com. And he's currently a product design manager at Facebook. Please welcome Nick Fink to the stage. All right. I'm trying something new. So everybody wave your hands. This is live on Facebook right now. Turn them on. All right. So I'm not going to spend too much more time talking about me, because that's not important. Um, you can always get to my website, and I'll show you the URL at the end, as well as some books. Um, I'm just going to jump right in because I have entirely too many slides. How many people here have ADD? Great. This is going to work out perfect. Um, all right. So uh, technology. Um, I want to kind of start with uh, where technology kind of began um, and wh where things were going um, a while back, right? This is how we archived our photos, right? This is a Getty uh, 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 image library archive, um, and uh, it, it just stores hundreds of, like, Im or thousands, millions of images, <laughs> and uh, and lots of videos. Um, and this is like what was normal at the time, right? Um, and we didn't think anything of it. I still have photos like packed away in closets and like Tupperware things, meaning to put them in the scrapbook or something at some point. Um, and then of course we in introduced technology to uh, storing of information and processing of information, right? Um, uh, we got good old Moore's law, right? Um, and basically, this is this is like a totally butchered summary of what Moore's Law is. So, like, feel feel free to like complain, and you get to argue the semantics and whether it's two years or eighteen months. But um, essentially, it looks something like this, right? Um, with more processing power um, and and costs go down and things like that, um, to basically have a higher impact um, with technology. Well, transition to today. This is Primeville's data center for Facebook. Um, this, this thing is ridiculously big, um, and it stores a lot of, of information, um, and it processes a lot of information. Um, I tried to show this in like you know comparable numbers of what really a terabit meant, and you know what you know billions of pieces of information and content meant, um, but it was, the number didn't fit in the slide without being like two point font or something. But, um, so we went to this kind of space where. Technology was easy to implement. Storage was easy to get. It was uh, it was low cost um, because we had been doing it for so long, and things just got more affordable and more affordable. As that was happening, of course, computers became more affordable. And as computers became more affordable, more people started adopting you know technologies and getting online and stuff like that. Um, so here's uh, internet usage of numbers globally, worldwide. Um, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and it's not just a US thing, right? And I'll, I'll kind of show a couple examples of why I feel that way. Um, this is actually just all pulled from just a public site that anybody can access the data. I mean, it's great stuff. Um, but you can see here what it looked like from 1990 to 2014. Um, quite a considerable incline, um, right, of adoption. Um, so we look at like broadband, because broadband is what delivers some of this high end content, some video and things like that, right? This is adoption for uh, broadband. Um, and uh, man, those Germans, I got to tell you. <laughs> um, but you, you, you kind of see here, um, there's exponential growth as well. And uh, you know, some, some are starting to plateau off a little bit. You know, they've kind of reached their capacity for broadband in those areas and regions. Um, but uh, you kind of see that things are sort of trending in this more information, more technology, more access. And then, of course, what happened? Well, you know, the iPhone came around, right? And just blew everything away. You know, we just started, everybody started using their mobile device to use internet. How many people here have tried to use internet on a device prior to the iPhone releasing? Wasn't that like a miserable experience, right? Like, it was like, oh my god, I, you know, like scrolling on maps was like a nightmare because you had the little dial thing and everything. Um, and that's, that's, this is where we're at, right? And you can see the adoption going up astronomically, right? Um, and it's going to continue to go up. In fact, mobile usage is going up Why standard web desktop usage, things like this device, are going to actually become obsolete pretty fast. Um, you start looking at uh, 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 things like Echo and other things that are like, um, you know, not a traditional desktop interface. Those are going to start to become more prevalent. Um, this is all great. 
but all this stuff kind of comes at a cost, right? And I'm going to probably show some things that you might have seen before, um, but uh, I have a kind of interesting curve on this. Um, we're kind of living in this sort of technology tsunami, right? Um, we're sort of inundated by the stuff around us, right? Um, you know, pretty soon, um, you know, your, your wash machine is going to tell you that it's finished with the load. Oh, wait, you could do that today. That's right. Um, you know, and, and, and you talk about Internet of Things. Everything is going to be plugged in. Everything is going to have access. And you've got mobile capabilities on top of it, right? Uh, this is that famous slide everybody always shows is at the top. This is the uh, announcement of the Pope in 2005 and then in 2013, right? Um, and those are not lighters, those are screens, and somebody, of course, has a big giant tablet or something, there's like a pamphlet or whatever, I don't know. Um, but um, this adoption rate is, is continuing to impact the way we kind of operate, because if you look at the 2005 photo, everybody's looking at the experience. You look at the 2013 photo, everybody's looking at the experience through some other device, right? So we kind of have to survive through this sort of tsunami, right? And uh, going from the Pope to Darwin, um, basically, it's not the strongest, it's not the most intelligent, right? It's the most adaptable. We have to adapt to the technology around us, right? Um, but we're not really surviving, we're barely existing in this space. We're sort of in a, in a mode where we're just trying to figure things out, trying to figure out how stuff works together. You know, hell, just getting the damn printer to work is like a miracle in some cases, right? Um, and we used to think about things like um, what was important to us in our, in our careers was things like work-life balance. And it still is, but it's now work-life technology, right? Because technology is everywhere. You pretty much can't unplug from work anymore most, right? Um, and that's just the way things have been operating and companies are taking advantage of that. And it's going to, you know, it's not we're going to be tied down to a desktop, hitting email all day, you know, and that sort of stuff. No, it's in your pocket and it's ringing and trying to FaceTime you and say, hey, you know, let's, let's chat, you know. Um, so we start to move uh, into this kind of interesting space with all this technology and all this information being stored online, this data, the accessibility of this data. Um, and we start to move into kind of an age of understanding. And this is sort of kind of the next iteration that I feel like is, well, sort of kind of already here um, in maybe not such a good way as we thought it would be introduced to us, um, but um, it is. Um, and it's about transparency, right? Information and access, uh, accessibility, uh, accessible information to everybody. Um, and uh, this guy, Lawrence Lessing, long before he was a presidential candidate, um, actually had some good ideas too in the past. Um, and uh, he's, you can look him up, um, but he, you know, Creative Commons, all sorts of stuff. But one of the things that's interesting is he talks about essentially taking the combination of Moore, Moore's Law as well as the low co lower cost of technology and storing data um, and you start to get into this kind of space where you basically have overwhelming information. In fact, you have competing information. You have information that is not actually factual, right? You see stuff posted all the time. Somebody's like, this celebrity died, and then you find out like an hour later, your friend is sending you the Snopes thing saying like, no, actually that's a rumor. That was around two years ago. You just forgot about it, you know, or whatever. Um, so with this information, really when we look at kind of how we think about information and data and how we how we gain wisdom through that. Um, it sort of follows this old school sort of model. Um, and I added the awesomeness just because I feel that's cool. Um, but uh, basically you start with data and then you move to information. And with that information combined with a couple pieces of information, metrics, information, context, um, and you get knowledge out of it. And with that knowledge comes wisdom. And that's sort of the direction we're headed, right? So. I think really with all this data coming at us and all this information accessible, um, we're really looking at a future that's really not about finding information, it's about understanding it um, and making sense of it. So this is kind of what I feel is sort of the understanding era. Um, and we're moving into this era pretty quick and I don't think we're kind of all really prepared for it um, because it does come at a cost, right? And um, what I call sort of uh, the death of lies, which kind of sounds more like an episode of the House of Cards, right? Or something like that, maybe? I don't know. Um, but, but, you know, what I'm kind of talking about is the accessibility of information that otherwise wasn't public in the past. Things like what's sown and surfaced, right? Um, a lot of inf interesting information, kind of alarming, kind of alarming what's going on with that, right? And how it's impacting how we operate, you know, in our world, what, what our privacy is, what information is actually exposed to who. Um, 
So this is something that we're going to have to overcome. We're going to have to actually be able to trust the technology that we're using. And this particular scenario lost basically trust with that technology and that information. And then you start to question what information do you really want to expose? And then maybe you go into this rabid mode of like ripping everything offline because you don't want it out there, because you don't want people to know, you know, like whatever, you know, or you just don't want them to know too much about you and be too stalkerish, right? Um, so I'm going to move from this topic because it's a very deep topic and we go on for hours about this um, to something uh, uh, with the current state of things and especially in the financial space. Um, innovation and disruption, right? So this is kind of where we're at. A lot of technologies, a lot of startups are going on. Um, they're coming up with ideas that are interesting and they're somehow surpassing established long-term businesses and industries. Um, there's a book on this. Um, it's called The Innovator's Dilemma. How many people have read this book? Okay, for the hands that didn't come up, go check it out. Go get the ebook, whatever, save some paper. Um, but um, essentially, this is, again, a, a horrible butchered summary of the book. Um, but basically, um, it's talking about um, existing businesses maintaining the status quo and optimizing for perfection. And that optimization is important for those businesses because every time they optimize, they get a little bit of uptick in sales, right? Or a little bit of uptick in revenue or something, right? The problem is, is you get a company that doesn't have all that baggage, doesn't have the legacy technology, doesn't have old servers, doesn't rely maybe even on a data center and uses the cloud or whatever else. And for a very ridiculously cheap way to go about it, they get actually surpass that, that existing uh, market leader in no time flat. And that's essentially what this is about. Um, here's a diagram kind of explaining it, um, but basically you kind of see there in the middle is disruptive innovation, which is really what this book's about. Um, and the way I actually like to describe it in kind of more plain language is it's really Gretzky. Um, it's, it's about, you know, sort of skating to where the puck will be, not where it is today, right? Um, so when we think about disrupting an industry, we look at what we want the industry to be, and we stop worrying about how the industry is today and our competition and how they're operating today, right? So um, he also, uh, and well, this kind of encapsulates disruptive innovation, um, again, a butchered summary. So please read the book. It's way more thorough than this. Um, but in order to fit on the slide and not be here for three hours, this is what I have. Um, so these these disruptors are all around us. We, we use their products. We're, we're fully immersed in disruptive technology, one way or another, especially Seattle. Um, here's a good example of some of the disruptors around. So you might recognize a few of them. Um, and and these, these folks are, are really taking an industry that used to be very much stagnant in a lot of ways for innovation and moving it beyond that space into an industry where it really serves the customer's needs better, right? Through ease of use of technology, quick adoption, quick response times. Um, I started using Uber because I couldn't figure out when the hell a cab was going to call, you know, was going to show up when I had called ahead of time, maybe even scheduled the day before and missed several flights because of this, right? Now I can track where this person's at, you know? They're not just five minutes away every time I call for the next three hours, right? <laughs> SpaceX is doing some pretty interesting stuff. Simple, arguably Tesla is, right? Some pretty innovative stuff. All these companies are. And this is just a fraction. This is like the 1% of the top 50. Okay? Um, so he also came out, the same author, um, came out with another kind of follow-up book. And I believe this book actually encapsulates some, or at least paraphrases some of the prior book. Um, but uh, this is kind of talking about, well, how do we innovate at a reasonable pace? Because... There's, there's a way to innovate and disrupt an entire industry and then fall flat on your face. And that happens all the time in the technology space. We see startups collapsing all the time, even though the product is really innovative, right? This book talks a little bit about how to sustain that in a reasonable way that you don't get caught into the legacy model where you're constantly optimizing, but you're still innovating, but you're not getting into a point where you can't sustain the upward trajectory that, that you're going in, right? Um, and these... Disruptors that we have today, I mean, they do give, <laughs> right? Um, we do care. We do, we do care about um, how technology impacts people's lives. And we're starting to care more. And we're starting to see a lot of things in, in, 
in, in kind of this space that is sort of like not the way we intend it to be used and it's being used and it's actually causing problems. It's causing people to not be good communicators in some cases because they're not used to like talking to other humans because they're online and chat, right? Um, we're looking down at our phones and we're horrible at like running into buildings and street signs, right? Um, so like we need technology that adopts to the way we operate and not something that we have to adopt to it, right? So this kind of gets into this other part, which I've talked about before, um, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase it here, but it's our duty as information architects and people in the information space to kind of understand the impact of what we design and what we build. Um, Josh showed several examples of e-commerce sites. How frustrating can it be to use e-commerce site that, that has that gigantic menu and you're spending like 15 minutes trying to find the thing you might be looking for instead of you know, reducing down things like the paradox of choice and allowing us to kind of navigate quickly into something. So as Don Norman said, uh, user experience and designing for kind of the digital era, basically it's not just, you know, um, about making something functional or easy to use, right? But it actually, actually has to have joy and excitement and pleasure, and fun, beauty, right? And this is kind of the art of user experience design, right? And I think a lot of people have kind of like detached themselves from this, this original quote. And this, I don't know when he originally said this, but it was a bit ago. Um, and lost track of what um, uh, user experience really is and, and feel that it's really interaction design. And it's not. It's so much more than that. Here's a good example of an uh, uh, iPad uh, system that was designed for people with uh, learning disabilities. This is actually impacting somebody's life in a way they never had before, right? These folks, are, these kids are going to go on and go, grow up and, and have a better life because of the technology, not despite it. So as <laughs> Mike Montero, who drops more F-bombs than anybody I know, um, uh, said, design works in the service of a better world, always has and always should, right? He gives an entire talk. You can go look it up online about this kind of thing. Um, and, and I feel like that's true. And I feel like as information architects, we're also designers. We're designers, at the very least, of metadata, of information, right? We sculpt that into experiences, right? Um, but we can't solve the problems that we have today with looking at things the, the way we always have. We have to kind of think different. This is the original think different, long before Steve Jobs, right? Um, so we, we kind of have to look at it in a different context in that as people who work in, like, say, user-centered design or follow user-centered design process, uh, we must not think of our design world as designing for a sing single person, right? That's, that's very finite, right? Um, what we need to do is think of designing for humanity. How is what I just designed, if adopted by hundreds and thousands, maybe even millions of people, going to impact the world? It's going to impact those people. Right? If I design a 10 second leg on the Facebook app, every person using Facebook in the world, and that is a large number, is going impact, to be impacted and lose 10 seconds of their days. Right? Performance matters. Usability matters. E ease of use. Findability, of course. Things like that. So to go to Gandhi, we're kind of the makers of our own state. We kind of caused this problem because we've pushed this technology and we've built up all this infrastructure, and everybody's using it now, which is awesome. But we have to kind of think about how this impacts everybody's lives. And we need to not wait until like the government or somebody else steps in and says, hey, this is wrong. We need to fix this. Or our business tells us, yeah, you know what? We, we, this is causing a problem with a bunch of people. It's our jobs as people in information technology and in the design world to actually guide that conversation and take action on it. So. What I feel like we need to do is find ways to basically better manage technology and information and how to craft experiences that foster a better future. So I would say architect the future you want to see. That's kind of the goal here, right? Thank you. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I probably have maybe some time for questions. These are the books I was talking about. Questions, questions. Everybody just wants to get to happy hour, I know. <laughs>
No questions. All right. Thanks.